Uh, before we want, before we get started, man, I wanted to make sure that um, just in case somebody is triggered, give a trigger warning. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, issues with racial injustice. We're going to be talking about mental health um, and things of that nature. So if anybody is triggered by this, I wanted to make sure that uh, you're aware of some of the things we'll be discussing. So guys, I wanted to start off by kind of introducing myself and then I'll allow each of you guys to kind of introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Dewan Bennett. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Uh, I've been practicing for 13 years. I have a private practice here in Dallas. Um, specialized in couples, trauma, uh, depression, anxiety, things of that nature. I wanted to create or create an opportunity for us to discuss some of the things that are going on culturally and for us to be able to talk about these things and kind of get the brother's perspective. Uh, so, you know, who else do we start with but my actual brothers? Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Galloway. Uh, I'm a marriage and family intern. Also, I'm a life coach, uh, actually at DeWan's facility. Uh, DeWan been a counseling. You can find me there. Um, also worked for the, I've worked for the state of Texas in the family protective services realm and several different umbrellas for about 10 years. My name is Patrick Turner. I am a high school counselor for um, a school in the Bay Area, as well as I'm a mental health support advocate for a couple programs um, throughout California as well. My name is Alex, like uh, Dewana said. Uh, I am currently program director in higher education. Uh, dealing with programs for helping students with mental health issues and also uh, making sure they're meeting their basic needs which deals with food clothing uh, and shelter uh, i've been working in the clinical social work realm for over 10 years in your acute and subacute mental health facilities uh, and providing mental health therapy within the community and the bay area hello everyone my name is dag i'm an attorney working in the private sector uh, equity owner in a statewide law firm uh, just here to provide a legal perspective to this conversation that we're having and i hope that everyone takes away that uh, we do have rights um, and there are such rights that need to be upheld. So this is an important conversation to have amongst us. Hi, I'm Paris Gary. I'm currently a dean at a higher education institution here in California. Um, hopefully I can provide some educational perspective on how we address this from a systematic view with students attending school at, during this time. Everybody, I'm Jacoby Bradley. Uh, I am in the law enforcement career. Um, I have been in that field for approximately six years now. I've worked in settings that are more high crime cities, and I've also worked in areas that that are not as uh, high crime as others. I'm here to provide a uh, level of insight from the law enforcement standpoint and also provide some insight to uh, different perspectives that not have been, that may may have not have been discussed in the past. Thank you guys. And I, I really appreciate you guys taking time to talk about this topic. So let's begin um, our first question. So on May 25th, 2002, George Floyd, a black man, was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. His murder, which was recorded, lit a fire in the U.S. as well as around the world. There have been over 60 countries protesting on every continent except for Antarctica. How do you guys feel about all the civil unrest that we're currently experiencing? I think the, the Black community is at a point to where we are fed up with the picture that has been portrayed that we are dangerous and that we are the ones to fear. And we can be, it's a scare tactic to say, if you do something, you will then, here goes the consequence. Mm -hmm. So all we're gonna show you in the media is the portrayed monster of the black community, meaning mm -hmm. you rob, you kill, you destroy your own community, mm -hmm. it's your fault. And I think the social unrest now is the black community is standing up to one, unite together to say, we are more than what the media only shows you, because that's all mm -hmm. you see is the negative points of our community. And two, I'm happy to see the unrest in our community because it's bringing unity and it's creating a movement now that is letting the world know that we are no less than anybody else. That the, how history has played out, it needs to stop now. We we do not need the cycle of putting our community in their place to continue anymore. And I feel that's what's happened over, over all these years. And this murder was the straw that broke the camel's back. We've seen it so many times. And, and you know, as my other two brothers spoke about watching the videos, part of the reason why I, I pushed myself to watch those videos is because being in mental health, there's a, there's a, a part of called lived experience. Sometimes when connecting with our community to help them, sometimes they, they want to know, have you seen or been part of what I'm dealing with or what I'm going through firsthand? And although sometimes we don't have to have lived experience to meet the need, sometimes it's good to be able to say, you know what? I watched it also, or I experienced it. And I feel that pain that you're feeling because to watch it there, it's hard to watch that type of stuff. It's hard to see another man get killed that looks like me to say, you know, they're killing black people and getting away with it. And it's just, oh, he was, you know, let's make up the story about what was going on. So I'm glad people are standing up. I'm glad people are angry. I'm glad they're seeing the crowd of the black community say, we're not okay with this anymore. Usually you'll see a lot of rallies and protests and things. And then once the dust settles, it's back to normal. And that's not where we're at right now. The social unrest has turned this world upside down to say, we need to now take notice to a decade 
of issues that have been going on. So, you know, my point, I'm glad to see it. You know, I'm glad to be part to live through this. You know, I have a son that's going to have, that's going to learn about this in school. I want to be part of the change that we have been fighting to see for so many years. You know what, Alex, man, I, I appreciate you bringing up the point of conditioning and how conditioning works. I always tell people, you know, when you, uh, when you watch a, uh, a commercial, right, the, the purpose of that commercial the, the advertising and marketing of that commercial is to get you to want something, right? To get you to want to purchase something. So over time, they're going to constantly feed this message of the Pepsi commercial um, with the Pepsi. They spray water on it to make it look like it's nice and right out the freezer, right? To make you feel like, hey, when you're thirsty, this will quench your thirst. That same conditioning has been used in America for hundreds of years to make people believe that we are dangerous, to make people believe that we're threats, that we're rapists, that, that we're killers. And, you know, we're fathers, we're husbands, we're brothers, we're sons. We are all, you know, we all pay our taxes. We all um, out here, you know, volunteer and give back. And we, we love everyone. You know, I always say a lot of times, man, what, what happens in this, these situations, it's a lot of hate. But where does hate come from? It must stems from envy. Because we as black men, we don't hate people. We love everyone. Right. So then why you hate me? That takes a lot of energy. So what I always say is that that conditioning happens where one, we want people to be fearful of black people. But then two, we want black people to watch these videos and see, look, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't fall in line. This is what's going to happen to you if you're not compliant. And no matter what we do, you know, you know, Philando Castillo. OK, I'm a licensed gun hit, gun carrier, you know, uh, or, you know, our uh, Second Amendment right. Here's my here's my registration for my firearm you die, right? You, when you try to do the right things, then we, we find to be punished even when we're trying to be normal American citizens and, and engage in the same freedoms that everyone else has. And that, that becomes a more severe punishment because that has more of an internal effect on you of how you feel about yourself as a man and as a person. But although we love our black skin, it, it, it bothers us sometimes that other people can't see the beauty in who we are. Jacoby, what you got for us, sir? Um, when I'm out there representing not only myself and us as African American in the law enforcement career, the way that I approach situations is all always not just mindful of the law, but mindful of perception and people's opinions and um, the systematic racism and oppression that lives in our communities. So um, I'm gonna start by just saying, like I said, I agree that all like what all of you guys are saying is it's not okay. I think that. From the law enforcement standpoint, some of the things that I see that I feel is not only uh, a detriment to the situation um, is the fact that you have a lot of officers that are out there working um, that don't necessarily have exposure to our culture, um, let alone the Black community. So sometimes their actions are um, based on the, the, the understanding of fear and they are not necessarily looking at the situation from our flight or fear. So when you put people in situations in flight or fear situations, they, they typically respond in a way that, okay, I'm going to act out of fear. And I'm no longer, and I'm not willing to look at the situations in which our culture is facing and say that because you're in fear, that's an excuse for poor relationships with the people that you have to interact with. I think that not only do officers need more training in mental health, but they also need more training in diversity. Um, it's hard to look at some of the counterparts that come from very privileged um, backgrounds and see them working in communities that uh, do not necessarily share the same privileges as them. Um, and I think that when you come from a background like that and you are some, somewhat sheltered, it is displayed in a way you police. And that I think in itself is an injustice. That ignorance of not understanding the diversity that lies in different communities is a disservice to the people that you serve. I take pride in the fact that interacting with people and in my community and my communication skills have to be very much up to par because I do understand that my place as a black man in a uniform, people have to very quickly assess me for, do they think I'm one of them that they associate with unfair treatment or am I going to be somewhat of a person that they can look at as a person of reasoning, a person that is willing to understand and listen to those situations? So as I move through situations like that, um, it allows me to be more diversified in my choice making as a police officer. It allows me to take situations and look at them and say, how can I be most effective in this situation? And, and that's my goal is just to figure out at the end of my career, 
not how many arrests I affect on people and how many different things I've done in that aspect, but how many lives I can change without affecting arrests, because that is part of my power as a police officer. And it needs to be diversified in the thinking amongst others when they interact with people of any race, um, particularly the African-American race. I think, Jacoby, I think you brought up a great point um, when you're talking about the diversity in thinking, right? Creating a different way for people to think. Too often we hear in our community that, oh, you're black, you're educated, um, you own your own business, you have a family. Um, I'm pretty sure nothing has ever happened to you, right? I'm pretty sure you've never dealt with racism. You're educated, you can articulate yourself. Well, I'm pretty sure nobody has, has ever done to you. And I tell them, no, that's, that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, as a black man, I can think of countless situations where I dealt with racism, whether it was explicit, like, you know, somebody calling you the N word or somebody uh, calling you a coon or a monkey, right? Or, you know, or, or you know, walking up to you and drawing a, or, or, or taking a picture of you and drawing a swastika across your face or something like that, or something implicit where, you know, I think I remember guys um, when I was in school uh, in Oklahoma. Um, I went out with some of my, uh, some of my white friends, some of my classmates, and I got to the, to the restaurant. We were supposed to go sit down and eat. And I got to the restaurant probably 10 minutes before everyone. Um, I'm sitting outside. I got my truck. I got the, the loud truck, the loud music, the loud rims, right? I'm sitting outside. I'm um, at the time. I'm a business owner, right? Um, I'm sitting outside waiting on them. And I say, let me go in here and try to get us a table. So I walk into the restaurant and I'm like, Hey, it's eight of us. Um, I think I had on like, you know, a hoodie you know, probably some shorts. So in their mind, whatever, I don't know what they were thinking, but maybe I look like a thug. Long story short, I say, hey, I want to uh, reserve a table for eight. Now it's one African-American and seven white people, right? They're not there yet. And the lady tells me, oh, well, you know, we don't have any seating um, right now. So, you know, it's like, okay, so what's the long, what's the wait? She said, oh, it's probably about, maybe about two hours or so. So I was like, okay, so I go to my car and I'm, I'm going to text everybody that there's no seating. But something happened in the meantime where there was a delay between me texting and not texting. Well, one of my classmates pulled up and I didn't see them because they parked on the other side. They went in and they text me and said, hey, guys, I have our table. They're sitting us down now. So I was like, huh? So, you know, I walked back in the restaurant um, and asked them, well, did you make a reservation? Uh, my classmate was like, no, I walked in, told them I had a reservation. I mean, I wanted to um, get a table for eight. They said, give them a couple minutes and set us down. That bothered me so much, guys, that I just left. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't even let my classmates know. It just bothered me so much that I just left. And maybe in that time, I thought I was doing the right thing by not saying anything and just leaving, not making a scene. But that we shouldn't be conditioned to believe that our voices don't matter. That, that we can deal with those implicit forms of racism and it's just okay for us to walk away. As a black man, let me ask you guys this. In your personal lives, have you dealt with any racism? So my uncle taught me, good, better, best, never let them rest until your good is better and your better is best. Mm -hmm. He taught me that because he was like, you're always gonna have to be better than your mm -hmm. counterparts and then even though they're gonna still think you're less, you gotta be better than that. Um, and having that mindset, you always, and, and maybe this is just a learned behavior, you always pick up on, dang it, I have to step up more because I already know how you're judging me by the time I walk into the door. What are those, what are those more overt forms of aggression that you guys deal with? Because again, society doesn't believe that we're the type of black men that deal with that. We don't deal with that. We're not, we're not criminals, right? We don't, we don't deal with that type of stuff. But so, so what, 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 what have you guys seen? I'm, I'm going to give the, the, the simple one that really hit me more because I watched it happen. So I have a son who's 16 and he's a 16 year old, wears the hoodie. And this is where I almost lost it. Usually I contain it, but this is where I lost it. So we're going to a gas station. My son plays a sport. So he's kind of tired. He has his hoodie on. He's ahead of me in the line. And so as he's looking down at the items he's about to buy, the cash register lady types it in and she's like, hey, it's gonna be $5. So my son puts his money, you know, he, he goes to put his money down and the lady goes, is there a problem? And my son goes, no, why? Is there something that I, you know, no, I don't have a problem, what's the problem? She was like, well, you have your hoodie on and you're looking down. And he was like, do I have to say I'm tired and I'm just trying to give you this money so I can get my drink and I can go? And she was like, well, if you're going to have an attitude, we're not going to serve you there. So he's being calm, but she's like starting to escalate. So I step in and I was like, 
hey, what's the issue? And she was like, well, this young man, and she starts to go into how he's being disrespectful. And I was like, not only is that my son, I watched what took place. You're completely out of line. And at that point, she was like, oh, well, and then the backtracking. And I think we all know once that backtracking starts to happen, mm -hmm. like, you know what? Not only did you really step out of line, you knew you were stepping out of line. I think that's mm -hmm. what bothers us more is you know, you know, you know what you're doing when you, when you have those situations. And I think at this point, again, I'll go back to the Black community as well as what we're talking about right now. It's not ignorance almost anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it's on purpose. I know you know what you're doing mm -hmm. and you want to blatantly do it in front of me and say, no, that's not what it is. And I think that's what just continues to fuel the flames that we have right now. Okay. Pat, what you got for me, Pat? I know Pat, Pat he, he armed and ready. Most recently, um, I spoke at a protest in, La in Lafayette and this is my second time speaking at a protest. I actually just came to speak and then I was going to take off. As I go to leave after, after I've spoken to the crowd, and listen to everything and I'm hanging around fielding questions from families in the community they just want to know more and and then specifically one black male came up to me and he said man I, I'm really wanting to get into this education to teach African-American history and so while me and him are having a conversation on how we can make this happen for himself and while we're talking another white male walks past and he said hey 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 um, I actually got something to speak to you too. I had seen him pacing back and forth as I was having this dialogue with Brett and it was just a little crazy because he was wanting to throw himself in and he threw himself in. He said, I'd like to talk to you because uh, you sound very educated. And I said, that's a microaggression, man. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and that was my moment of saying, let me, I'm gonna get to you, but you, you actually insulted me before we even got to this point. You gotta realize, our ancestors were killed for education. Yes. So, and, and let's take this back during slavery days. If that was you, line was used on a on a black man back in that day, that man was damn near dead. That's a mm -hmm. deficit in that mark in having education and actually being able to speak prominently in front of any crowd. My last story is we, I'm a I have a daughter, and um, I'm putting my daughter to bed one day, um, and she goes to a very diverse daycare. And I was telling her to go to bed, go to bed. And she's, she was like, she started fake crying, right? And so I used the term, I said, stop fake crying. She said, I'm not fake, I'm not fake, I'm not fake, I'm not fake. I, I, my hair is not ugly, I'm not ugly, I, I'm not. And I, I'm like, excuse me, hold on, hold on. Let me take this moment, bedtime is canceled for now. Let's talk, baby. You know, she sat there and was really crying, internalizing. And I said, well, who told you these things? A white girl at daycare told her her hair. My daughter's hair, to me, is the most beautiful thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I want her to have her uh, image of herself to be so beautiful and re positive affirmation. She had to relearn. So I had to stand on a platform. Her parent, her mom, we have to sit on a platform to re-educate and reinform. And that she believes that she's beautiful. She knows that she's beautiful. And I'm not going to let society knock her down. I appreciate you sharing that story. Al, what you got for us? I went to a job interview in, um, in, in Marin, out in the Bay Area, and it was at a rehab facility to where it was private pay only. So, you know, your families, they, you know, people was in there, you get your own kind of cottage thing. Oh, it was crazy. It was like walking into a different world when I went there. So it was for, um, uh, it was for a management position, uh, helping their, um, their, their rehab counselors and things kind of get stuff together mm -hmm. on the back end on, a, on an admin level. So I'm interview, interviewing by this white lady. At the end of the interview, she was like, I have a question for you. And I was like, what? She was like, great interview, but I'm very confused why you're applying for this position. Now, at the time, I had dreads, you know, long dreads, whatever. But, you know, I was in there suited. My dreads was done, cleaned up, all that good stuff, um, looking real on point. Um, but I was like, you know, she was like, I'm really confused why you're applying for this position. I was like, why? I meet all the qualifications. She was like, I would think you were playing football somewhere. When I tell you it was dead silence in the room. And I was like, and I, and like, I had to like catch myself because I like, it shocked me. And I, she could tell because she turned bloodshot red and she tried to back. Oh no, I don't, I don't mean, I was like football. She was like, I mean, you're just a big guy. And I mean, like, you know, you got the hair going. I was like, I, it, and I, you know, it got to a moment to where I had to really catch myself and I had to sit there and I was just like, do you think that's okay? And she was like, oh, I didn't mean it. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that. It just, you know, you just come off like you look like you play football or did you play in college or high school? I was like, what? I was like, what does that got to do with the job interview? And literally I was like, I don't have no questions for you. 
I guarantee you, I left the place. They called me. Do you want the job? No, I don't want it. And lady was like, why? She's like, well, this is salary. I was like, it's not paying enough. Oh, well, I don't want it. At that moment, I felt like I, if I say something, one, it'll tarnish, like they'll put my name out there because it was like a real ritzy, prominent type of place. Really? You know, people sometimes pay over 100K to send their family members there or whatever. In my mind, I was like, one, I you, you're black. So you can't, you can't go off because if you go off, then you're labeled now. And then if you go off, they'll put your name and feed it all through the network in terms of mental health industry. Mm -hmm. Don't hire this guy because he's a loose cannon. And they won't tell the story of what happened or why I got mad or why I went off. But now all this stuff happens. Like, was that the smartest thing to be silent? But that was like a, 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 an example in my life, which it pushed me to say, I need to get into a seat to where I control my own fate in this professional world that when I speak, people listen. Let's think about it, Alex. You was applying for a mental health position, right? In the mental health world, right? Come on, be yourself. We accept everyone regardless of issues, flaws, right? This is supposed to be a melting pot of helping, right? These are the empathetic people, the sympathetic people, the people who connect with you as a human being who still found a way to label you and put you in a box. And I think that is one of the issues sometimes even in our community in the mental health right? We send our kids to go get treated and rightfully so we should. We should all take care of our mental health just the way we take care of our physical health. But what happens is the fear that we have is we go to see a mental health professional and they slap a diagnosis on us that now later on in our life, we're applying for a job, but the FBI or the government or something like that, they see that evaluation. You mean to tell me this person is bipolar or they're schizophrenic or they have a conduct disorder or antisocial personality disorder, ADHD, right? We are the ones who are constantly getting labeled, but not getting the help. Not because we don't want the help, because you say, oh, black people are complaining, right? There's plenty of research that says that when black people go to the hospital, they don't get help because doctors feel they are complaining, right? You think about COVID, right? The disproportionate rate of African-Americans who are affected by COVID, who are dying from COVID, right? Now, again, if some people want to say, oh, well, that's because of pre-existing health conditions. We all have pre-existing health conditions. We all have something, right? Or is it when I walk into a space, people don't see me as a person. So I can't even get the help that I need. That a little girl can't go to school and, and her friends just see her as a person. They have to put her in a box because of her hair or her skin color, right? You got to be put in a box because you're a dreads, right? Think about that. Jeff, you're in the mental health community as well. What would you like to speak on in regards to the racism that you've, that you've experienced and dealt with? I was going to say something that popped out to me. We was talking about scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. I was in college. I had just bought a new car. I got a bright, I got a yellow car. Uh, I had just bought the car that had no plates on it. I see the police. I pull up to the Renaissance. It was no big deal. Uh, I, I get out. The cop just come flashing, looking in the car, whatever. I'm like, what's up, man? You need something? You're like, oh, this your car? I'm like, yeah, it's my car. You know, you, what's going on? It's, um, it's parked. I'm not even in the car no more. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, uh, it's been a rash of uh, cars being stolen at this lot that you bought this car from. I'm like, bro, what, what they got to do with me? The mm -hmm. car was parked. I ain't got nothing to do with that. You see me pull up. So he like, sit down on the curb. For what? I'm eating this hot dog, bro. Can I finish my sandwich? You know, like, so he's like, sit down on the curb. Uh, let me run the plate. So he runs the thing down there like, all right, you ain't got no warrants. What warrants got to do with you looking into my car, me eating a hot dog? It's, it's mm -hmm. two, separate, two different things. I didn't bring no laws, no nothing. You look mm -hmm. to see if I had something going on because you seen a young black man in a new car. You see what I'm saying? It was just the craziest thing. I want to get to Brother Dag. So Brother Dag, what do you have to say in, in light to this? Um, you know, I think in uh, my personal life, I think one of the stories that, that, that comes to mind to me was... Um, when I was an undergrad, it was over uh, winter break. And so the basketball players stay over in the dorms. And so one of our friends was on the basketball team. So I was picking them up because we were going to go out. We were in college. I had two of my friends now, fraternity brothers with me in the vehicle, you know, driving my beat up two door Toyota Tercel, barely go 60 miles per hour. So, you know, uh, we get to the back of the dorms. And, and we sit there and I'm waiting for our friend to come down. And all of a sudden, the two campus cops just come barreling down the back. Um, the, the dormitories at, at where we were at at Sacramento State, you're able to go in the back. So they come in, they box us in. And the next thing that we see is lasers inside of the cars. So at that point, you know, I just put my hands to the side like this. And I hear the officer say, you know, toss your keys out the window. So I Toss my keys out of the window. Then he told me to open my own car door. I do that. 
He tells me to get out. I get out, start walking backwards to him. I do that. I walk all the way backwards until I feel the uh, muzzle of his gun to the back of my head. So he props the gun on the back of my head with one hand and reaches with the other hand for his cuffs. And then he cuffs me while he still has (laughs) the firearm in my head. And only when does he pull down my one arm that he take off the firearm because now he needs to use his other arm to cuff my other arm. Um, So he proceeds to do that and he pulls out two of my friends that are in the vehicle as well and asks us if we were doing donuts in the parking lot. I'm in a 96 Toyota Tercel two-door. They (laughs) physically can't do donuts. Either way, I tell him no. I said, we were not doing that. I'm here to pick up my friend. And as soon as I say that, sure enough, my, my friend comes out from the back of his dorm to see three of his friends cuffed with two squad cars lit up. And I proceed to tell him that we go to school here. And, and he questions that. And I say, well, my ID's in my pants. I said, I'm a criminal justice major. I said, what you're doing is wrong. And so at that point, he only reaches in my pocket and sees the ID. Uh, at that point in time, a third vehicle approaches a police officer. Uh, but this time it was a black officer. And when that officer pulled up to the scene, um, the two white officers that were there present then immediately stood us up and they took us out of our handcuffs, um, gave us back our IDs, told us we were free to go. Um, and so, you know, you have personal events that occur to you when you're in college, whether you're outside of college. And, you know, people think that when you ascent into the professional realm, uh, whether you're an educator, law enforcement, uh, mental health um, advocate or mental health professional, uh, or an attorney that you don't face the uh, same uh, either racial overtone or microaggressions. You know, I think this was my first summer interning for a county where I went to high school in. I interned for the public defender's office. This may have been maybe three, four weeks into that internship. There are meetings with a judge that are called indicated. And so there was a judge that had wanted to have a meeting with me that I would be meeting the prosecutor uh, with the judge. So mind you, when I go to work, I'm not in basketball shorts. I'm not in a t-shirt. I'm not in a wife beater. I'm not in some J's or some Vans. I'm in a suit. I have my work bag. I have my badge. I proceed to walk into the department um, and the meeting is obviously before court is adjourned or court begins. And, and I walk into the department because the door was open and I turn around and I close the door. And as I walk in, the bailiff that's in the courtroom, which is the county sheriff, stands up and says to me, stop, defendants are not allowed to come in here until court starts. And before I can even get a word out to say anything else, he says, do you have an attorney for your case? And, I, and, I, and at that moment, I just had to stop. I told him, I said, um, I'm a certified law clerk with the public defender's office. I'm in law school. I said, I can go get my supervisor if you want me to. And at that point in time, his face went flush red because he realized what he did. Mm-hmm. You assume that a young black male entered the courtroom that you didn't know. So instead of asking who I am, he automatically assumed that A, I was a defendant and that too, that I must be there charged for a crime because he asked me if I had an attorney, you know, and I never spoke up about this to anyone because this was three, four weeks into my internship. I didn't want to make it seem like I was ungrateful to be there. Uh, Mind you, the head of the office at that time at the public defender's office was a wonderful woman who I am sure would have spearheaded this issue um, had I said anything about it. You know, I chose to internalize it because... I didn't want to make things difficult for myself. And, and ever since I, that day, when I would step into the courtroom, this sheriff would try to talk to me or say hi and, and, and go out of his way to make sure that you know, he was atoning for his behavior. Those implicit biased views of viewing somebody as another person that you have seen before. Um, mm-hmm. Just because you see one Black criminal doesn't make the next 10 black guys that are the same age and description criminals. I I don't know who said this. I've read it in the media the last couple of days. If you have uh, a police officer unit that is uh, 1,010 cops and you have 1,000 amazing officers who, who do their job fairly, equally, and rightfully, but you have 10 that are biased, that are oppressing people of color that are doing their jobs incorrectly, if those thousand officers don't speak up about the 10, then what you really have is you have 1,010 bad officers. There has to be a change. Um, yes. this, this, is, this is not hard. It's judging people for, for who they are as a person 
So I think there's a degree that we all have to hold the people that are with us accountable, you know, and that becomes really important. How many of you guys, your first experience by show of hand uh, with, with the gun was by a police officer showing you a gun or pulling the gun on you by show of hand? So, so that's, that's five out of six African-American men to their first experience with, 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 with the gun violence was a police officer introducing that to them. Think about the trauma that we experience when the first time we have a gun put up. We grew up in some of the roughest neighborhoods. There's this perception that you go into these communities in the inner city and you're going to experience your trauma there. And yes, we do experience trauma within our inner city. You know, we got violence, we got a drug addiction, we got poverty. We have a lot of things that we do experience, but are, we're also being traumatized by guns being pulled out on us by those who are meant to protect us. Guys, I remember this. I was 16 years old. I was working at Marine World, now known as Six Flags. It was, it was Halloween. They were about to close. So I was outside with my friends, but now I needed to re-enter to go get my stuff because they were about to close. It's the last day. It's Halloween. It's going to close for the season. So I need to re-enter, which normally is no problem. I have my badge. So I try to go to re-enter and they wouldn't even, the police wouldn't even allow me to get to the point. I'm trying to explain to them, hey, I work here. I'm trying to re-enter. Um, they wouldn't allow me. I'm arguing with the police. Yes, I am. I'm pleading my case. I'm speaking my opinion. I'm not doing anything disrespectful. I'm speaking my opinion, right? My first amendment right. Speak my case. As I'm getting ready to finally walk away from the police, because I've been uh, arguing with them for five minutes, trying to show them my badge and everything. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. As I'm getting ready to walk away, guys, I'm 5'10", 115 pounds. Y'all knew I was bony, bony, skinny in, in, in high school. Two police officers rushed me, slammed me in the bushes, pulled out a gun on me, held the gun to the back of my head and cuffed me. To, to take me into Marine World, where I was trying to get into, to the little place where they detain you, to only find out that I was actually an employee, instead of Instead of believing me, that was my introduction to a gun being pointed pointed to me. Now, now Jacoby, you know, you know, obviously, you know, as a as a as a um, a police officer as well as a black man, you know, this affects you on twofold because you have your personal experiences that you dealt with prior to being a, a a police officer. You currently also have your experiences being a black police officer, right? So you have a lot of those experiences. Do you want to speak to those experiences? You know, particularly with being a black man and then a black man as a police officer. I'm just thinking about back when at an early age, I did own my own house. I drove pretty decent looking cars. Um, and I experienced it in my neighborhood and I found this situation to be pretty unique because at the time I was living in a house, I had a Lexus. Um, my neighbor was a young kid. He was about 10 to 12 years old. And so he would cut grass in the neighborhood. For, he was a kid of mixed race. His dad was black and his mom was white. So he came by one day and I asked him, could he cut my grass? So every once in a while, he would come by and cut the grass. Well, long story short, one day I walk outside just to say what's up. I see him passing by on his day from school and he wouldn't even acknowledge me or look at me. But he had an older brother in the neighborhood. So I stopped his older brother and I was like, hey, what's up with your brother, man? He, he, he won't even say hi when I speak to him now. I was told that not only could he not speak to me, but the reason he wasn't cutting my grass anymore was because his mom thought that I was a dope dealer. That the only reason that I could live in that house and drive that vehicle at such a young age, there was no excuse except for the fact that I was a dope dealer. One of the things I wanted to, to kind of uh, wrap this up with, guys, because I know you guys have busy lives, is... Um, with everything that's going on, uh, what suggestions do you have for people? Um, you know, what are you guys doing day to day with your coping skills or to relieve your stress and anxiety? What are you doing and what, what recommendations or suggestions do you have for people who may be out here struggling to, to deal with everything that's going on in the world? The mo the best key for me has been, man, and, and is to have this brotherhood in this network, man, and, and whether it was just through laughter and it's just through educating each other on how to better support having a dialogue in a space like this because it helps you just like we do when we inform our brothers and our sisters of what this is like when you get pulled over by the police or what this is. It provides an example so that we can come home alive. There's also just some information to pass on to my kid. Like I just recently bought this book for just to have an illustration in the moment. I got it for my son too. <laughs> You know, yes. it's called Know My Rights in the Bill of Rights. And just being able, by my son Lennon, just to having that conversation with our kids. Just for me, um, like I always, the number one message I push is self-care is the best care. Finding things that you enjoy, whether it's writing, journaling, 
reading, kind of center yourself, shut out all the noise of the media and the distraction that's going on and take care of yourself. You know, if, if we're not okay mentally and physically, then there's no way we're gonna be able to help and change what's going on around us. If you're feeling any kind of way, my best advice is to say something. And as people, we don't know what goes on in our minds, so we can't read your mind. So if you're feeling down, depressed, have any anxiety, you know, just feeling desensitized by, by everything that's going on, your best and strongest tool to use is your voice. Voice your voice. Yeah. I, great point. I think that's that needed to be said that, you know, one way we advocate for ourselves is our voice, right? Mental health is everyone's responsibility. And I think it's uh, it's important. That's how we we keep ourselves stable. Is 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 as we advocate for ourselves. Jeff, what are some things that that you do to make sure that you are taking care of yourself? It's it's hard not to take some of this stuff home, and I try my best to leave work at work. But some of the stuff that I'm doing, people laugh at me all the time. Man, I play video games, bro. I'm mm -hmm. on Madden. If you want to see me, I got FIFA. I ain't that good. Uh, me and my wife, we love the we love food, so I'm in the kitchen all the time, or I'm barbecuing, or something like that to keep my mind off of things as well as working out. Me and Pat was talking about how you go running. Now you got a bike. I ain't got no bike, but I, I did buy a punching bag. I got a ladder and a jump rope, perfect push up, all those kind of things. The one sent me a book called Cry Like a Man. I just finished that. And for people that may not have insurance or young people and your parents have insurance, your parents have this program called EAP. It's called Employee Assistance Program. They can utilize that for free services in regards to mental health. So they can use it for free. It ain't not at no cost. It's probably, you probably can't pick where you go. You probably get five, six, or more, depending upon your job or their job. Utilize those services because they are free. I can say like a, uh, a way for you to get something out or if something mm -hmm. is inside the family to get something mm -hmm. out, it can be used in multiple in multiple ways. But take care of that program. I think you brought up a great thing about uh, EAPs. A lot of people don't know about it. Employee assistant programs and, and nowadays most companies have it. You're going to be pressed to find if you work for a, a large company or a school district or a government agency and they don't have an EAP program, which allows you to go and see a therapist outside of that workplace. Your therapist of choice, as long as they're connected with that EAP uh, program uh, for free. And it, it's, it's, you know, some companies have three sessions and there, there are some companies that has up to 25 sessions. So it really just depends on who your company is uh, with. I would tell people advocate for your company to, to have, uh, to be connected with uh, EAP providers um, that allow as many free sessions as possible because it allows you to go out, talk to someone. Um, there's no pressure with it out of your pocket. You know, you allow yourself to kind of have an outlet. Pat and Alex spoke to this um, and, and uh, Jacoby, the importance of having those friends that you can laugh and joke with. I think for the most part, most of us are, we spend a lot of time making fun of each other, you know, uh, having jokes, right? Uh, you know, while we've been having this discussion, we've been side texting jokes, making fun of each other. I think it shows a lot where you can have men who can, you know, be professional as well and know how to let the hair down and have fun, right? And sometimes we get lost and always feeling like we need to be so professional at all points in time in our life. And remember, man, fun is, is one of the most natural things that you can do to make you feel better, right? Having fun, your happy hormones, your oxytocin, right? You get that from your hug and touch and affection, your serotonin, you get that from service, helping somebody out. Your dopamine, you get that for doing something for someone or somebody telling you, great job. I'm happy that you did that. You know, your accolades and then your, your, uh, your, your endorphins, you get that from working out that, that, that you, when your body is, is flooding you with endorphins to make you feel good and repair your body. So those are the things that you do that makes you feel happy naturally. So I always encourage people to go out, have fun, journal, talk with friends, read some good books. Jeff brought up Cry Like a Man by Jason Williams. And man, if you are a black man, I suggest you read this book. It really helps you address issues with being, with being vulnerable and shows you how your lack of vulnerability, your lack of willing to say, hey, this bothers me. Your lack of willing to say, hey, I cried at night. Your lack of willingness to say, hey, I need some attention, affection, and love. How that affects us and plagues us in our relationships uh, later on in life. So uh, we got the punching bags and we box, I run. I spend time with my family, man. I've been trying to be very intentional and in making sure me and my wife are sitting down and watching movies together and having certain discussions, as well as my son. Um, you know, you guys talked about that talk you know, um, and having that talk with your kid. And that's unfortunate as, as, as a black man, I have a six year old son and I've had to have talks with him about how to conduct himself in public and how to conduct himself if he's ever approached by a police officer. And somebody may say that's a very premature conversation. You know, somebody, I wish somebody would, would we have told that to Tamir Rice and his family, a 12 year old man, right? 12 year old child who was treated like a man, right? A child. Now think about that. If a 12 year old who's playing with guns, something that we all did, I was fearful when people used to try to buy toy guns for my kid. Like, nah, he don't need that because he can't engage in this normal childhood thing, cops and robbers, because the fear is somebody 
won't use uh, common sense and pull up on him and say, hey, are you okay? No, that they're going to just pull out, on, pull up on him and shoot. So I think that self-care obviously is important. Self-care is the things that you do that make you have fun. Don't worry about the people judging your self-care as long as they're helping you and not harm. this association is disconnecting us from the realities of the world. We need to spend as much time as we can engaging in things that's going to help provide clarity. So that's reading, journaling, talking out loud, seeking mental health professionals, things of that nature. I want us to take the time to thank all you guys, um, you know, in your very busy schedules, man, jumping on here. All you guys are professionals. Y'all have lives and we all married, man, and have children and all that type of stuff, man. And I know we have to get back to life. So I appreciate you, brothers, man. We'll definitely be doing more of these uh, discussions. Make sure you stretch, too. Okay. Bro, I just got a cramp. Bro, it, it, hey, y'all must have knew it. Bro, it hit me. I had to, I had to turn the video off. <laughs> I had to turn it. That Charlie horse boy, that boy heard it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it.